hey, then you can also subscribe to our uh, mailing list, which can be found on our website. Uh, on our website, which has been uh, yeah, it's been clear, cleaned up a little bit, it should be uh, easier to find things. And among them are the uh, videos that we record, uh, which reminds me, I've, ah, someone's done this already. We're recording. Thank you, Anna. When Anna's here, then uh, who's the co-organizer, then those things happen. Uh, for sure. So our speaker uh, today is uh, Marianne Hickendorf from uh, Leiden University. We're very happy to welcome her here. Um, she is assistant professor of uh, educational sciences in Leiden, and uh, but she specializes on mathematics education, uh, primary education, and uh, she's also active for CITO, uh, where which is the Dutch institute where they uh, develop exams. And uh, she'll uh, talk today about uh, word problems and strategy flexibility. So uh, please, uh, Marianne, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And, and also uh, thank you all for, for showing up, quite a large group. Um, I uh, was thinking, what, what should I tell? And I decided to choose two uh, research lines that uh, I've been working on. One is on word problems. And the other one is on strategy flexibility. And then I thought, well, there should be some kind of over overarching theme or title. So I thought both are contemporary issues in math education, but I won't really relate the two. So kind of two separate stories. Um, and let's see. so um, in contemporary or current math education, we uh, try to strive for something like adaptive ex expertise, not only procedural expertise, but also problem solving, doing mathematics, and things like creativity, flexibility, and adaptivity. Um, so that's that's one part of, of co uh, current uh, math education. And uh, relatedly, word problems, or context opgave, you would call it in Dutch, um, story problems, it's, it's always difficult to translate, but I will use the term word problems to refer to the broader category of context opgave, also with illustrations. Um, they play a central role in uh, today's math education for several reasons. They uh, are thought to uh, enhance mot children's motivation, but also to give a meaning to mathematical concepts and skills to make them concrete. Um, and um, the other thing is that uh, children should um, use math in everyday life situations so those is more that's more the application uh, part of math uh, of word problems sorry um and i will start my uh talk with the word problems part um to give you an idea of the kind of problems that i have been studying this is one a problem that was part of a national assessment in 2004 i think so you also see it's not only words, but also an illustration um, where the, 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 the arithmetic problem of 17 times 30.10 is, um, is situated in a story of mother. I don't know why it's always mother, so I hope they're going to change that. But mother is buying curtain uh, material. And the question is, how much does she have to pay? Um, of course, you can imagine that you uh, th those kind of problems are everywhere. If you open a math textbook or a uh, mathematics assessments like the ones from CEDO, um, you see that they're everywhere. Um, and my major question of this research line is um, to, to find out what the effect of uh, is on, on students' problem solving of presenting a pro an arithmetic problem like this one in this story. Does it help or hinder performance? And do, do children use different types of solution strategies? Um, so the basic question is, is this context or situations or stories uh, in which word problems are presented, do they help or hinder? And you can think of, theoretically, you can think of two kind of perspectives. Of course, these are, not, these are kind of simplified, but I've one I've called a cognitive perspective, where um, if you think of the word problem solving models from, uh, for instance, uh, Lieven van Schaffel and colleagues, they have this model that um, you have to follow several steps to come to a solution. Because first you have the story, then you have to uh, 
uh, form a mental model, a situation model, and then you have to form the mathematical model, and then you have to solve it. So you have several extra steps that you need to take before you come to the, the arithmetic problem that you would have to solve. So if there are more steps or more processes involved, more things can go wrong. You have to read, you have to understand, you have to uh, create the right arithmetic uh, sentence, you could say. Um, so a coro uh, an, uh, corollary hypothesis of this perspective is that word problems are probably more difficult than what I call symbolic problems, or in Dutch, kale rekenopgaven, so without any situation or story. That's one perspective. But another perspective, which I call the math at perspective, is um, that word problem problems can also do something different. They can activate real world knowledge. They, they shoot, that's why they are uh, word problems. Um, and by doing, by, by this real world knowledge, by activating concrete or making the math concrete, you can also use different strategies, more meaningful or more informal strategies. And particularly for more abstract content, um, this can actually help students uh, to solve problems. So they might be able to solve problems that are situated in a context, whereas they are not able to solve the same problem if it's without this context, because they don't know what to do if it's not concrete. So and a hypothesis of this perspective is that word problems can be easier than symbolic problems. So these kind of conflicting hypotheses, uh, I try to get more grip on that by uh, empirical studies. I did four uh, consecutive studies, all involving the, the distinction between uh, or contrasting word problems with symbolic problems, Kahlo. And I started with a study in early arithmetic, uh, grades one to three, so group three to five, and then one in grade six. Um, and then the third study is I manipulated the types of word problems to make them more complex uh, in children from grade three to six. And finally, we studied fraction arithmetic because fractions are quite complex and we think that uh, that is a, a, a domain where the situating the problems might really help. And we did that in grade six from primary school, but also grade seven and eight, so the first grades of secondary school. And we also addressed whether there are uh, differential relations with uh, individual difference variables, like the most important one, reading comprehension, because of course you have to be able to understand the text or the problem to solve it. Um, and also some home language, um, we don't have that in all the studies. And more general cognitive resources like nonverbal reasoning and working memory. So this is the basic setup of the studies uh, into word problems. By the way, if there are any pressing questions, please ask them. I don't know how, maybe say something in the chat or just shout. I don't have to talk all the time. I can, but I don't have to. <laughs> Uh, normally we have uh, like a 45 minute yeah. to 60 minutes presentation and then discussion, but usually also we allow questions uh, for clarifications in between. Yeah, okay. So you can put in a chat or raise it by uh, hand. Yeah. Okay, so this first study was um, in uh, early arithmetic, grades one to three. And what we did there is we used um, problems from uh, CITO's student monitoring system, the Learning Volk system, um, where, um, so this is a, a word problem from uh, the first grade test of CITO. And you also see that they don't have to read, uh, students don't have to read the, the text themselves, the teacher reads it out loud. Um, and so the students solved a set of this kind of uh, word problems. And they also solved a separate set of uh, symbolic problems like this one. Um, and there were uh, quite a few, like about 700 students per grade. So the sample size was pretty large. And also the number of problems was pretty large. So WP is, uh, WP, sorry, is word problems. But this, this was data from CETO. And unfortunately, they didn't match the, um, the problem. So in this work problems, you had to uh, solve 11 uh, plus 4, but there was no 
uh, parallel 11 plus fours uh, problem in symbolic format. So we could not compare the difficulty level of those uh, problems directly, unfortunately. And before going into the results of this study, I will go to a related study um, in uh, grade six, so more advanced arithmetic. So there is mother buying the curtains uh, again. And we had a symbolic uh, parallel version. So uh, children solved either this uh, 17 times 30.10 in a word problem and the other one symbolically or the other way around, we counterbalanced that. So we could compare the difficulty level of the same problem in word problem format or in symbolic format. But about 700 students and eight times uh, eight problems um, times two. And what we concluded from those studies um, in this in the, the, the younger children, we could compute a, a correlation between uh, performance on word problems and performance on symbolic problems. And the latent correlations uh, were uh, between 0.81 and 0.87. That means that they're highly related, but uh, because it's latent correlations, they, they uh, are corrected for unreliability. So they're not one. The correlations aren't one. So we can still say that somehow, some, to some extent, distinct abilities in solving the two types of problems. And that is also supported by the fact that we found differential effects of language level in the expected direction. Reading comprehension level was uh, more strongly related to word problem solving than solving symbolic problems. And the same held for home language students. The difference between students who spoke Dutch and who spoke something else was larger on solving word problems where you need to read and understand than on the symbolic problems. So that is one part of the story. But then in the second study we're with sixth graders, uh, we found that this latent cor latent correlation between the two types of performance dimensions was was actually one. So we cannot statistically separate them. And um, we did not find uh, differences in the difficulty level of the problems in the, between the two formats. We did not find any differences in the strategies that the students used. Um, and there were also no differential relationship with all language level variables. So that held for students with who were weak in reading and who were strong in reading. So that might be a little bit surprising and it's also a bit counter, counter the, the uh, or in contrast with, with things that you hear in the media that, that math is so much so verbal. I think uh, that um, in this kind of um, problems or assessments, uh, so this is students at the end of grade six, they're 12 years old, they have done a lot of math, they've done a lot of work problem solving. The texts are not that difficult because these were problems also used from uh, adapted from CITOS test that they, they do take. Uh, they're very cautious in uh, the wordings that they choose. Um, so. I think that the, my idea is that the most uh, reasonable explanation is that. Students at this stage at their uh, of their math education, they have developed very uh, the well developed cognitive schemas or schemata for these typical, simple, one-step work problems. They just see them and know immediately what to do. And to test that um, idea or that hypothesis, I did a, a third study with work problems that were more complex. And also um, there was a gap between uh, the one study ended at grade three and the other study was in grade six, so I also completed that gap from grade three, four, five, and six. Um, so I wanted to see whether uh, this was only for typical one-step word problems, uh, that there was no difference in performance and strategy use, um, by including more challenging problems, more challenging in two ways, mathematically by um, not only using one-step arithmetic, but also two-step arithmetic. I will come at examples later. Um, and also uh, another type of making it more challenging was by not only including standard word problems where there is nothing really challenging, 
but also non-standard word problems. And I chose to include an, a number that they that students had to ignore, an irrelevant number, which they're not really used to in, in uh, particularly not in assessments. So an example here is a group of six persons buys two bottles of wine, they pay blah, blah, blah. And that they buy two bottles of wine, you don't really, that is something, the two you can ignore. Um, but students might be inclined to do something with that. Or um, it might force them or encourage them to read more closely what they actually have to do instead of kind of undressing the problem and looking for the most um, uh, obvious uh, arithmetical, arithmetic computation that they would have to do. Um, so, and I included more student factors, not only reading comprehension, but also working memory and nonverbal reasoning. So more general cognitive, domain general cognitive resources. We had 444 students from grade three to six. Um, they solved 48 problems across five formats. So you can see my arrow now, can you? It makes sense to do this. Um, so we had one step arithmetic and two step arithmetic. And within the one step arithmetic, we had symbolic problems, standard word problems, and non standard word problems. And the difference between these latter two is the irrelevant, oh, sorry, didn't want to do that. The irrelevant number of, here it's uh, that the contestants of a kind of a cycling race come from 10 different countries or they come from different countries. So that's the manipulation here, that, that the 10 is irrelevant. And this is just a symbolic version. For the two-step arithmetic, we could not include uh, a symbolic version because you would have to work with brackets and primary school students have not, uh, are not used to that. So unfortunately, could not offer these kind of problems. So we only had a standard word problem uh, where they had to combine addition or extraction addition or subtraction with multiplication or division, and one with um, the irrelevant number three in this case, that, that, that there are three DVDs is not really important here, or irrelevant here. So this was the study design. This is the number of problems per, uh, per type. And uh, the first question was, could, whether I could replicate the finding that standard one-step work problems are just as difficult as symbolic problems. And to do that, we made this um, comparison. And we found that in, the, in younger children, grade three and four, symbolic problems were somewhat easier, non-significantly. Um, and in grades five and six, the work problems were somewhat easier, non-significantly. Um, and uh, of course, why would I uh, present non-significant results? Well, the interaction effect between grade and uh, problem format was significant. So this, and this is the interpretation of that. So this kind of, um, is kind of in line with what I would expect that um, for younger children, um, the, the reading part adds to the difficulty of the problems and that, that diminishes and maybe even flips around for older children. And um, regarding the individual differences variables, uh, nonverbal reasoning was stronger related to performance on work problems that I expected that, but I expected all um, individual differences, also reading comprehension and working memory to be more strongly related um, to the standard work problems because you have to do more, but that was not what the results showed. It was only nonverbal reasoning, but that what was in the expected direction. Uh, as a second research question, I compared, made this comparison within the standard word problems. I wanted to know uh, the difference between one step problems and two step problems. So they were arithmetically or mathematically more complex, the two step problems. Uh, but the children did just as well. Uh, perform, it was a little bit lower, but it was not significant. And uh, reading comprehension was more strongly related with two-step problems, two-step word problems than one-step word problems. So apparently, um, this, this where you have to um, translate uh, the, the story 
that contains a two-step word problem into the arithmetic draws more heavily on your understanding or comprehension processes than if it's just a one-step problem. And the cognitive resources were no, not differentially related with the two problem types. And the final question was, what about these non-standard problems? Are they, do they find them more difficult? And do, they, do these kind of problems draw more heavily on, on, on reading comprehension or cognitive resources? And the short answer is no. There was no difference. They were just as difficult and there was no differential relation. So that was kind of unexpected. Um, but apparently they were not hindered by the irrelevant number that, that they had to ignore. So my conclusion from this study is that already in third grade, so group five, students seem helped nor hindered by the realistic stories in this standard one step work problems. And I think that is very relevant in light of what I said before, it, it, it often heard criticism that, that uh, math uh, assessments are so verbal because apparently children don't experience that much difficulties with that. And uh, comprehension or reading comprehension processes seem more important in two-step arithmetic problems. And that uh, result teachers could use if they want to train comprehension processes, comprehension of situated math. And that might be useful to reduce the risk that students rely on superficial strategies because we know that they do. They tend to, uh, from other uh, research by, by the group of uh, Lieven van Schaffel, that uh, students tend to look at the problem, look at signal words, undress the problem, fi find, find the arithmetic that is uh, hidden and just uh, solve that without really making any realistic considerations. But if they don't make realistic considerations, then I don't think there's much added value of situating the problem as a word problem to start with. So two-step problems might be more challenging for that and more um, stimulating for students to really think about or understand the situation that is sketched. Um, and surprisingly, students did not seem bothered by this irrelevant number they had to ignore. Um, so that draws, uh, that, that raises the question that other non-routine work problems um, with two irrelevant numbers, maybe things would happen, but this manipulation did not uh, make a difference. So this was all uh, whole number arithmetic. And the final study I would like to uh, say something about is uh, fraction arithmetic. Uh, where it's not published yet, we're working on it. Draft version is almost ready. It's almost ready to submit. Mariam, can I ask a question about the previous uh, study? Uh, so yeah. the final slide? Yep, yeah, thank one. you. Yeah, yeah, suddenly I saw the uh, two words, yeah, realistic and authentic. So are these different kinds of uh, things or oh no not authentic no I realistic no, i don't stories. think i use the word authentic no realistic stories so in what sense were the stories realistic or you mean um outside mathematics or yeah this is it refers to a concrete situation yeah okay. that's in, yeah. in the outside world in the real world <laughs> yeah yeah so the, the main question was um so i think you uh, compare average performance on either word problems or symbolic problems. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that doesn't automatically imply that always they will perform the same or. Oh, individual bit, students, you mean? Yeah, no, no and on the, on the word problem also, uh, there might be that, that, that on some word problems they score less well and others they score better. There might be aspects, characteristics of word problems that, that in some cases help or in some cases hinder. It could be the case, I guess, or not. Well, I did check per problem whether the uh, um, these problems differed significantly uh, ah, in difficulty okay. level. But of course, you're absolutely right that it depends on the problem. And I can easily make up a word problem that will be very difficult, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. That, that makes it difficult to interpret general findings because they sometimes suggest that it's always the same or it's always different or yeah, no, I, I understand what you mean, but I, I, what I did to, to kind of uh, um, capture that is to, I used problems from real assessments. Yeah. 
because my main interest or my starting point was that uh, actually uh, the state secretary of state at that time, Sharon Dijksma, she said in the newspaper, if you can't read, you uh, you will fail at math. And I thought, I don't know if it's true, at, at, particularly for older students. And, and uh, so that was my starting point. And that, that's why I uh, selected problems from real assessments to see if, if for those problems, students are really hindered by the uh, contexts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't have an overview of who has, of course, I can have an overview. Um, can I also oh ask God, yeah. Question, yeah? Uh, because I'm, I was wondering, you already said something about uh, controlling the problems. Uh, in the example you gave, there is a difference in word length, uh, or not in word length, in sentence length. Uh, did you control for the number of words or, or other uh, Features. You mean, uh, uh, wait, I have to go back. In this. Yes. Um, the short answer, well, of course, within this uh, standard and non-standard one, it differs one number, the mm -hmm. irrelevant number. Um, but of course, these differ in word length. That is true. And I did not control for that. OK, because I was wondering if that might also explain that you didn't find a difference between the one and two step because visually at least the two steps seem easier in this particular example. Yeah, the, yeah. I, I, you could be right, but of course the numbers or the, the math that you have to do is also very different. So it's actually a, a, a bit of an uh, apples and what do you compare apples and pears? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that my major interest was uh, not so much in whether the two-step problems were more difficult or not, because you're right, there are more factors influencing that, um, but uh, particularly whether they have differential relations with reading comprehension and also the other cognitive resources. Yeah, but, but I, I, would, think, I would yeah. imagine that sentence length would make a difference in that as well, but maybe... Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. And so that was not accounted for. I think that there are three sentences in each case that just maybe. Yeah, that, that, yes, it's always the three part structure, but the synthesis different length. Yeah. Let's have a last question, urgent question uh, from. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of related because I was uh, wondering the, the previous. Um, Example that you gave uh, from grade six with the. Um, what did you say? And where mother buys the curtains? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, I. Because that's a, a quite different structure of um, word problem in the sense. Um, this, uh, the, um, it's it's much easier because this is kind of the way that things are asked, and, and the other one that you used to to re replicate uh, has a much more has much more um, extra information. So um, that's related. But I was also wondering if in this case um, they are so used to multiplication as um, in in this kind of format um, that that's the reason that they see immediately this word problem and the symbolic multiplication as the same because they also already did this for whole number arithmetic um, and that that makes them evenly difficult. So I was wondering is this the same if you test this earlier in the uh, learning uh, path where they start with word problems for the first time for multiplication because this is already they already learned multiplication and they learned word problems yeah. for multiplication so i i'm really interesting if it's it would be the same for whole number arithmetic where they have for, for the first time word problems and maybe it relates to the other thing that i thought you checked does it hinder or help more in a test situation yeah. And not if it helps or hinder in the learning process. 
No, you're absolutely right. That, okay. Of course, and that is so to start with your last comment, that is, of course, in, in essence, much more interesting because that's why you would use more problems. Um, uh, so that's that's hard to say anything or much about with these results. So it's only if um, at this at a particular point in the learning trajectory, if you offer them these kind of problems, does it um, help them or hinder them? As I said, uh, I, I was inspired to do this work from these kind of statements in, in the media. Um, and you said from uh, did, I think you're absolutely, I agree with that, that these kind of problems, uh, children are so experienced in multiplication and so experienced in these types of uh, work problems to present multiplication situations that they just see that. So that is actually um, this uh, last uh, um, rectangle here, that they are just experienced work problem solvers. And you said, what about if they start learning multiplication? Well, I did. So in this study, I also have students from grade three. Of course, mm -hmm. they learn it a little bit earlier, but there's also division. So they, they're more beginning learners. Mm -hmm. And um, also for third graders, there was no difference in the okay. word problem format and the symbolic problems across. So that was found uh, across grades. That is. Yeah, because you said somewhere that. Yeah. This. They were a little bit easier symbolic. A little bit easier, yeah, true. Yeah, so but not significant. Yeah. That's because of, maybe could this be because they are used to a certain format of uh, representation of multiplication, or in this case, subtraction. Um, and this word problem is maybe, the, because it's quite long for a subtraction, um, if it was more in, in simple, like the, the goat uh, example, yeah. would being different. Yeah, that could be, of course. Yeah, but, but this is one example of a problem. There were mm -hmm. uh, in total uh, 48 to, um, two formats, three formats. So it's, um, I, I, and I don't know by, by heart how long all the sentences were and uh, what kind of, <laughs> it's been a while since yeah. uh, we did that study. Um, but but I think that the, the, the points mentioned now, that these are important drawbacks or limitations of the study uh, uh, design that, that I also mentioned uh, in the articles. Um, let's see. So I would like to move to fractions now. Um, yes, perfect. And um, so we, we've seen that in this whole number of arithmetic it doesn't seem to help nor hinder when you offer students uh, problems in word problem format or symbolically. Um, but fractions, the story might be a little bit different. We, that's what we tried to find out. We know that fractions are very important uh, also for later math, and, uh, but the, the students find them very difficult for all, all, all kinds of reasons. I won't go into detail now, but for instance, that um, one fourth uh, they think that it's smaller than, than one fifth because four is smaller than five. But for fractions, it's the other way around. And also, um, the, the formal procedure for uh, division by a fraction with multiplication of the opposite, it's very abstract. Students don't really know why that would work. Perhaps they could perform it, but they don't probably don't understand. And um, Real world models like the, the, the obvious pizzas and pies could make such problems, uh, such arithmetic, fraction arithmetic, easier to understand, fractions easier to understand and manipulate. And that's actually uh, one of the reasons that uh, primary school focuses very heavily on situated fractions to make them more concrete and uh, be able to manipulate them. Uh, but we know uh, also from uh, uh, Geke's thesis, which we studied uh, quite well, that um, there's a kind of sudden transition in the learning trajectory because in secondary education there is a um, the, the students suddenly switch to symbolic fractions um, so there's a kind of discontinue discontinuity in the learning trajectory for fractions regarding situ whether they are situated or not and um, so what we did is uh, kind of similar to uh, the other studies. We had um, symbolic fraction problems and we had uh, situated fraction problems. Um, 
so this is the I'm sorry, I did not translate this into English, but there uh, from all the children in the classroom, uh, one uh, half is. Uh, uh, sport Twitter um, does a sport and um, from those kin from those kids that are sporting five ninth are playing tennis, which share of the whole class is playing tennis. And um, this is a second a multiplication problem where you have the, the symbolic one and a situated one. And we had parallel problems and counterbalancing. Well, I won't go into detail. This is the most important uh, um, part of the design. And we had 24 fraction problems and also to, to see if we again um, find no problem format effect in whole number arithmetic like we did before, we also included those problems. And as I said before, because of this discontinuity in the learning trajectory, we wanted to see whether there is a difference between students in primary school. So we did uh, grade six because fractions are difficult and also uh, and secondary school. So we also had students from um, the first two uh, grades in secondary education. And um, these are the results for um, fraction arithmetic performance for fraction addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. And for the first three operations, the differences were not significant. Although you see a slight advantage of symbolic problems. Over word problems, which is what we did not expect. We were expected particularly for fractions to be that word problems would be uh, easier because they give them this concrete uh, way of thinking about it. But we did the only significant difference that we found was for fraction division, and that was in the expected direction that situating them those problems in a realistic situation helps performance. And that was not really surprising to us because the as I, yeah, this this procedure, the, the, the formal procedure for fraction division is very abstract and probably quite difficult for students. So uh, and and if you um, use a model of pizzas or pies or whatever, you can come up with more um, intuitive or informal ways of performing such a division problem. And what was also um, oh, I think we said the wrong uh, word, doesn't matter. Um, of course, we hope to find, uh, well, we were looking for differential effects of grade, but there were no effects of grade whatsoever. So the students at grade six performed at the same level as the secondary uh, the students in the second class, second grade of secondary education. So they did not learn, they did not make any progress. Well, it's not the same students, of course, it's cross-sectional. Um, so that was also surprising and we also we expected that especially primary school students would show a word problem advantage and that that would uh, decrease or maybe even flip for secondary education students and such an effect was not found either. So what we found in this study is that for the most complex or the most abstract operation fraction division um, situating those kind of pro arithmetic um, as in word problems, it makes it easier. Um, so to illustrate that the, the problem in green was easier than the problem in red. Um, so three fourths divided by one eighth. If you can, if you come up with a pi with three fourths and try to stick, uh, put up the, put in the one eighth bits, then you can also see, kind of see it or visualize it, make it more concrete. Um, but we also found that, uh, which makes, uh, of course, is, uh, makes sense, that the word problem story or situation it should support the mental model that students need to come up with a proper um, procedure. Because this problem that I showed before, we found that a lot of children answered five ninth. So they did not do any calculation whatsoever. They just did not understand the uh, situation that we presented in the way that we um, aimed. So that could explain that in fraction multiplication, it seemed like they did better on symbolic problems. And 
We sure found that there was hardly any progress in fractional arithmetic performance in the early grades of secondary school. So I don't think that's very good news, but I'm curious to hear what you think about that. So um, to wrap up the work problems part, um, these uh, studies showed that work problems are usually just as, oh, I see Geke has a question. Do you want to yeah. say it now? Oh. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. Just finish and I'll okay. ask later. Uh, I, I, work problems were usually just as difficult as symbolic problems, um, and we found no robust differential relation with reading comprehension. So I think that we can, the, the, the conclusion is that third to sixth graders are quite experienced work problem solvers, particularly for those one step uh, simple standard work problems. Um, but work problems can be easier for more abstract or more complex context, like uh, especially fraction uh, division. But only if the situation in this work problem uh, supports the appropriate mental model and arithmetic procedure that has to be done. Geke. Yeah, about ask? previous uh, slides. Yeah. <laughs> so. oh, this is my. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, unfortunately, still no growth um, in the first two years of the second. You found first. the same, didn't you? Yeah, I found yeah. the same. Yeah. yeah, doesn't surprise me. No. Um, unfortunately, I hoped it would be better, but still not. Um, I was wondering uh, because uh, the, the, the half times. Five nine, yeah. Ninth, ninth, yeah, ninth. yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, um, I, I noticed um, that in this case, um, I guess for students, it's uh, in the word problem five ninth times a half. Yeah, this is that is a this, yeah, could be. And I, I think that for students, half of five ninth is easier than five ninth times half. So I was wondering if this might have influenced the results. Well, so they did very poorly on this word problem version. Yeah, but I, I understand yeah. because they have. Um, you have to take five ninths part of a half, and if it would be yeah. way around, I think that the yeah. question would have been easier. Yeah, but th that is a, that is a good suggestion. Um, but what do you think about because we looked at the students answers and we saw uh, the answer of fifth, five ninth so very often, so they did not do any operation. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about that? Um, well, I maybe they hope that it was the correct answer <laughs> <laughs> because I think that they didn't know. I'm, I'm quite sure that they don't know how to take five ninth part of half because um, nine in the um, oh, my English denominator um, yeah. is one of the difficult uh, denominators. Um, so um, that's kind of in, in my study. It was a, a difficult denominator state just couldn't. Yeah. Do. So um, if the denominator was easier, for example, if it was three quarters and so half deal open sports and then yeah. three quarter of this part is in tennis, then maybe you would also have had different uh, results, but it's it's quite because they are so poor at this kind of arithmetic and they didn't learn it uh, the, the right way. It's very difficult. You get uh, a, a little difference in your uh, question. It gives immediately a difficult result. So it's really hard to yeah. investigate this. Um, yeah, it was also really hard to come up with kind of realistic stories because yeah. who, who ever asks this question? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for this small discussion. Uh, Rahir, if you don't mind, I suggest we uh, let Marana to tell her second story because it's uh, already a lot of time has passed and I know that uh, that was just a half of the thing. Right? Yeah, I don't know if it's half of the slides. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> I think maybe we listen you to the end and then uh, also more general discussion can be run. Thanks. OK, then I'll quickly move to the uh, second part about strategy flexibility. So to give you an idea of what I will be talking about, if uh, well, maybe also you to see if you're still awake, uh, how would you solve this problem if you were not allowed to use a calculator? 
I'm not going to ask you, um, but you, at least you thought about it. There are different ways. Uh, of course, you know that you could uh, add on from the. Uh, oh, I also have to think about the well, the second number, second operand. I don't know the English word right now. Um, or you could um, do the jump strategy where you subtract first 60 and then seven. Or you could put the numbers in the vertical format and do the uh, digit wise algorithm. There are different ways, of course, and all could look could lead to a um, correct answer. And uh, one of the um, aims of uh, math education is that students acquire something like uh, adapt adaptivity, creativity, flexibility, um, or adaptive expertise, as I call it here. Um, and theoretically, I, I split it up in two components. I said uh, we have flexibility, which involves that you have a, a, a repertoire of different strategies, so you can use various strategies on the same problem. And um, the other thing is that you uh, would acqu uh, acquire adaptivity, that you know uh, and select the best strategy, the optimal strategy. And of course, optimal is uh, uh, ambiguous because op optimal with respect to what? You could, uh, you usually see in the literature that people reason in two ways, either optimal with respect to the numbers in the task, that it's an, an easy strategy for a particular uh, task, um, or that you look at the individual uh, efficiency. Of the, 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 if a student solves a problem with different strategies, which strategy is best for him or for her? So that is with respect to individual strategy efficiency. I'll come back to that later. Um, and this adaptive expertise is important for several reasons. We know that it's an indicator of deeper mathematical understanding, and it's also a key aspect in development of uh, later math competence. And more practically, it's just part of our curriculum. It's within the uh, kerndoelen and referentie niveaus, handig rekenen. And we know from research that uh, students are not so much inclined to use different strategies. They are much more inclined to consistently use the same strategy for all kinds of problems, irrespective of the uh, numbers within the problem. But we also know that they might know more than they would spontaneously show if they ask them, for instance, if you can solve a problem in a different way, they may be able to do so. And that um, that that uh, that uh, finding that there might be kind of hidden potential, that was um, the reason for me to make to try to capture all of that, to try to capture uh, flexibility and adaptivity both what they spontaneously show and what they know. And I start with um, potential, what I call potential flexibilities that students might know different strategies. And part of that is that they would actually also use different strategies. So that is what I call practical flexibility. So within this flexibility um, concept of, of using a strategy repertoire, I make a distinction of what you know and what you show. And I do a similar thing for adaptivity. Um, if you know different strategies, you could also know how appropriate every strategy is for a particular problem and for you. And those all those things combined can lead to, so that would be potential adaptivity, but all those things combined could lead to practical adaptivity that you actually use the optimal strategy. And this was the um, th this is actually the um, research project for which I was awarded the Veni grant from uh, NWO. So what I this was the conceptual model uh, at the basis of the project, and I planned 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 to do different uh, studies at different levels of the curriculum. So you can um, um, distinguish these levels in the curriculum. You can say something about what the goals and standards are the intended curriculum. So those are in the Netherlands, the Kerndule, the Referentie Niveaus. Um, the next step is that you have the potentially implemented curriculum. That's what textbooks and assessments uh, make of those intended curriculum. Then you have a next level is what happens in the classroom, the implemented curriculum. And finally, you have the attained curriculum, student outcomes. And this is a model well known to Mark. Um, from his thesis, so I, I actually I used it from that. 
Um, and what I did is I did a first study to uh, see how flexible and adaptive students um, were. So students were, sorry. Um, so that is the attained curriculum. And we also addressed um, how these uh, aspects of flexibility and adaptivity were present in the implemented curriculum in the classroom and in the textbooks. And the final, um, the masterpiece of the project would be this study, where we simultaneously um, got our data on what students do and what their teachers do and the textbooks. So to, to see if, if there is a relation between uh, the um, implemented curriculum and what students really learn. And study one uh, is, is done. Study two, there's a pilot and study three is um, still waiting to be done and Corona doesn't really help. Um, so in this first study, uh, we um, came up with I wanted to measure all these components of potential flexibility, practical flexibility, potential adaptivity and practical adaptivity. And there are no measures available yet. So we, uh, I, I used things from the literature and um, tried to, to do my best. Um, so we came up with tasks for all these components and uh, administered them for uh, at, at 147 third grade students in the domain of multi-digit subtraction. And we had four focal strategies and for each of those strategies, we defined a problem type for which this strategy is optimal. And I think that's most easily shown from these two uh, strategies, a strategy called compensation, um, which is uh, efficient if the number that has to be subtracted is close to a round number. If you round it, 68 minus 20, that's easy, and then you have to compensate back the one. Um, and another, that's called a shortcut strategy because it's a handige strategy, an efficient strategy for particular problems. Another such shortcut strategy is indirect addition or adding on. And that is particularly efficient if the two numbers are close together and you can just add up, starting by 76, add four, add two, and you're done. And that's much easier than uh, subtracting 70, subtracting six, and having to borrow and all those kinds of steps. So we, we kind of hoped that um, students would, on these types of problems, uh, would use those shortcut strategies because that would show some uh, adaptivity, or at least adaptivity to task characteristics. So that was one of the things that we wanted to um, see. Uh, but I start with f uh, flexibility. So the strategy repertoire that students have, and we ask them to solve eight subtraction problems. So these four uh, types of problems, and for each type there were two problems. And they had to do it on paper, and they had to write down their work in a calculation box. And across these eight problems, they used on average 1.17 different strategies. Most students just used one strategy for across all these problems. So that was in line with what with previous findings, that they are not really flexible um, if you just ask them to solve a set of problems. But we wanted also to tap into this more, the, the, the hidden part, the potential flexibility. So we did two things. We asked them to solve the same eight problems that they had done before. There was one calculation book, but there were two calculation boxes beneath that. Do it again, but in a different way than you did in the first box. Um, and we also asked them, and that's what you see here, if we give the first step of a particular strategy, so here you see the first step of the jump strategy, we ask them to complete this and um, to see if they, if we give them someone more uh, to start with, if they knew this strategy, in this case, the jump strategy or not. And by combining that, those two measures to tap into what they know, they knew on average 1.82 strategies not really, um, yeah, still not close to the four that we uh, distinguish, but it was significantly higher than what they showed spontaneously. So there is indeed some hidden potential. They know more than they show. And the second thing was adaptivity to task characteristics. Um, 
So I, I showed you those typical problems. We had a typical indirect addition problems and we had typical compensation problems. And we asked how many times did students use that uh, best or task specific shortcut strategy? Well, hardly ever. That was the short answer. So they did hardly ever use those strategies. But if you, um, so this was the measure that we came up with for potential adaptivity. If you give them the four worked out examples of the four strategies for a particular problems, so this was a problem that is suited for indirect addition, they could sometimes, also not very often, but they um, could uh, uh, select this adding on strategy as the most um, that we ask. The, the best is so the best strategy. That's also not really high. We asked them for four problems and on average it was 0.7, but it's higher than what they spontaneously showed. So again, there is some hidden potential. And the final bit, and that uh, needs a little bit more elaboration, is adaptivity to, to individual efficiency data. We need to know first which strategy is optimal for a particular student on a particular problem. And that is always a very hard question. And what we did is we focused on two strategies. We, the strategy that the student used spontaneously when solving these eight problems in the very first run. And the one that is optimal from the perspective of this task. So either compensation or indirect additions for these um, problem types. We used the personalized choice, no choice method in which basically um, students have to solve the same problem twice, once with the uh, strategy they use themselves and once with, with the one that is most efficient for the task, given the um, numbers in the task. We coded how fast they were and if they got the correct answer and we used that to determine the optimal strategy, which was the fastest strategy leading to a correct answer. And surprisingly, on those uh, indirect addition problems, so problems with a small difference. This indirect addition strategy was the most efficient one only 22% of the times, whereas students' own strategy was the most efficient one 61% of the time. So a strategy that we think might be an, a smart, clever shortcut strategy is not so smart or clever for the students themselves. And for the compensation problems, this was more evenly split, but still, for half of the students, um, the shortcut strategy of compensation was not for them the best strategy. Um, and if we look at how many times they used their own optimal strategy, they used that on average about two problems, but they also used uh, the opposite strategy. So that was not the best strategy that led to the correct answer on more than one problem. And finally, we also ask them if you have these two strategies, um, which one do you think is best for you? So kind of whether they know which one, which strategy is best for themselves. And well, that was also not very convincing. They, they selected more than the other one, um, but not really uh, uh, convincingly. Okay. I'm, I'm wrapping up this part. Um, so we found, as in earlier research, that students' level of practical flexibility and adaptivity in strategy use is rather low. But they seem to have more strategies in their repertoire than they spontaneously use. So there's hidden flexibility potential. And they do seem to know more about shortcut strategies than they show. So there's also hidden adaptivity um, for task-related task -related adaptivity. But I think one of the most interesting findings is that um, this task specific shortcut strategy like compensation is not so efficient for individual students. So shortcut strategies are not necessarily easy strategies. And perhaps students are not so much inclined to use their strategies because they just don't know how. They uh, are not that, uh, they don't perform that well with those strategies. On the other end, there's also some hidden potential there. I'm, I'm speeding up a bit because, um, because of time. The final bit is um, the, uh, so this is the student outcomes. We also 
try to find more, find out something about how it is, this, this flexibility and activity is uh, covered in, in classrooms and in textbooks. Um, we know from uh, previous research that you could, uh, this um, flexibility and activity could be stimulated by uh, stimulating students to invent strategies, to reflect on strategies, to discuss, to compare strategies. Also, that teachers ask open questions and not very procedural questions, but more questions that require uh, deeper thinking. And we also know from studies in uh, Germany that textbooks may differ in the opportunity to learn flexibility and uh, adaptivity. Um, and we did uh, try to investigate what happens in the classroom without really going to the classroom, which is quite difficult. Um, we did. And we did that by interviewing teachers and we did a pilot study so far, so I don't have really um, robust findings, but we interviewed and we asked them which strategies do you cover? And you can of course count the number of strategies. But we also made use of, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, vignettes um, of classroom situations. Um, so for instance, if, if a student in a class uses this strategy in a classroom discussion, how would you respond? And we coded those responses for so-called facilitators. Did they um, model a strategy? Did they say something that stimulated reflection or discussion on the strategies? Or did they just say, well, that is a way, we don't, we don't use that way, we use the jump strategy. Um, so we tried by, by yeah, kind of mirroring real, uh, real classroom situations uh, to see to what extent they would stimulate flexibility and adaptivity in strategy use. We also did a pilot of classroom observations where we coded only the type of questioning. Um, where, and that also based on previous research by uh, colleagues from uh, the US, whether it's an open question, a question related to conceptual understanding or more procedural understanding or only factual knowledge. Um, and it's, it seems promising, but I don't I have to look into it more, uh, more deeply. And something we did with Mark, the textbook analysis. So we um, analyzed several textbooks, more traditional textbooks, Getal uh, Junior and Rekenzeker, and some more realistically oriented textbooks. So it was hard to, you know, to choose a formulation. Uh, Wereld in Getallen, uh, version 4 and 5, plus punt, also two consecutive versions, and Alles telt, two consecutive versions. And very briefly, the first results were, not surprisingly, that those traditional textbook, textbook um, offer less stimulation of flexibility and adaptivity than the realistic textbooks. Um, but something perhaps more interesting is that the newer version, so the more recent, recent version of the realistic textbooks also stimulate those things less than the older ones. So there seems to be a convergence towards more, more direct instruction in, in only several strategies. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so in, in all, it seems that these first pilot studies results show that there is room for improvement, both in the textbooks and in uh, the classroom. But perhaps a an, an, an more important question is to what extent is that important? And um, to what extent is it really? And I'm very curious to hear what you think. Um, how much, how important is this topic? Um, so as I said before, I would like to do this overall study relating student work and, and what happens in the classroom and in textbooks. But I, I hope to be able to do it somewhere. This, I don't know if the schools ever really allow uh, external people to uh, enter again hopefully somewhere this year. And uh, I, I want to, to give some, 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 there's no such thing as free publicity. Um, I wrote not this year as well. Next, uh, this Saturday, Ronald and I will um, uh, launch the um, book Leer ze rekenen, so learn them off, teach them off. Um, that is uh, uh, initiated by Didactief. Um, and Ronald and I, and also Hans van Luyt, probably well known to you as well, um, were part of the um, 
core editorial team that selected um, scientific publications, seminal publications, which were translated into practical um, tips for, for uh, educational practices for teachers. And uh, I'm very proud of the results. You as well, Ronald? Yes, yes, it's, I, I think it's uh, well, well, what's uh, well, because we have three totally different backgrounds. I think we what we do, did was uh, um, in a sense translate the three backgrounds into uh, one, well, quite a readable uh, book uh, with uh, spe specific uh, several uh, point of view combined. Uh, I, I think, we, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm quite surprised it finally worked out. <laughs> yeah, actually quite smoothly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and they yeah. are also the author is really uh, really did a great job in 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 writing it in a way that is appealing uh, to uh, well, yeah to teachers in this case. So that's that's not really related to um, the research that I've done, but talk well. Um, so I would like to end with um, opening the discussion. I would like to know, well, of course, there is a room for questions and uh, uh, comments, um, but I would like to know what do you think about the function of work problems and how they are currently used in teaching and assessment, and for strategy flexibility, how important you think it is, and if you have think other ideas on how to foster it or how to research it. So thank you very much for your attention so far. And um, Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Uh, many thought-provoking uh, issues also that you raise here uh, for us. I suggest that we as a traditionalists start from clarifying questions and uh, then I believe your questions to us actually also trigger some comments. Uh, and so if you have uh, small questions, you want to clarify something, then please go ahead. You may even just speak out or raise your hand. And uh, while everyone is uh, thinking, I have a clarifying question. Uh, I was not sure. Uh, oh, OK, there are already two people, but let me ask anyway. Uh, so from your first study, um, when you didn't find really uh, interrelation with uh, language uh, levels and so on, uh, what was the success rate? So could it be that there is one step specifically problems are just too simple? and uh, that uh, there is a ceiling effect. Yeah, that's a good question, but I think the success rate was 0 0.60, 0 0.70. It was definitely not at ceiling level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was not an explanation for the... Uh, okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, Difference relations, yeah. Thanks. So then I uh, also... Um, Rohir and then Marilyn, and then I see Paul's question in the chat. Yeah, Paul's question is it will be open on Saturday when we officially launch the book. <laughs> okay, sorry. Logia. Okay, so, so this is uh, patience is needed. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, my question is uh, about the first uh, research that you presented, and um, it's about those uh, word problems and uh, where the situation is supposed to support the re uh, the, the arithmetic with fractions. Mm -hmm. I was quite intrigued why it worked with multiplication and why. It, Sorry, why it was uh, it worked for uh, division and not for multiplication. So I just can we have a bit more a look uh, look a bit more at the, the exact sort of uh, problems you were setting, because one thing I noticed yeah. was, for example, the division. Uh, it was in kilos, uh, and yeah. uh, there I was tempted to switch to grams and and end up with a something else i i don't know i i had the feeling suddenly that oh it's it's probably very very important how the problem is is phrased here so one of the questions that i wondered were those questions really very representative and uh, you know was there some similarity between all the situations for division and all the situations for multiplication because then, you know, is it is it really the multiplication of the or the division, or is it the way the problem is the world problem is set? Uh, what what really makes the difference between those two categories? That that's what I was wondering. 
you see here the first problem has has, has the context of kilos yeah. and i can yeah. imagine that children just have memorized that three-fourths of a kilogram is 750 grams or something like that and then they have a different sort of computation whereas uh, the, the second one is a bit more abstract you would have to introduce yourself maybe thinking of oh let's let's think of a classroom with uh, 18 students or 36 so that's a very specific question but more generally uh, the question is are all problems more or less of the same shape with different numbers or do they have a different context each time of course they have different context because you cannot have a multiplication context a division problem context is different from a multiplication context so you cannot say that they're the same um we did yeah so um multiplication context with fraction fraction multiplication is usually taking part of something part of a fraction or part of whole numbers we also had those problems um and the division pro division fraction division problems are very difficult to come up with uh, with realistic yeah it's always the kilograms are there because if you don't add something concrete then you def never know if it's one eighth one eighth of what <laughs> You have to you have to make sure that it's the same base you you're referring to. Marianne, but maybe yeah. you can tell us uh, was there many different uh, problems within each condition? Or, or? Well, there were three multiplication contexts uh, and three division contexts, so it's okay. not just one problem. And uh, was the pattern of the results similar for? Yeah, that's a good question because for division it was and for multiplication it wasn't. And this problem on this slide, that was the one that stood out mm -hmm. um, with this very low performance on the work problem format. And that was that was why we were uh, started looking into the answers they had given and found out that they had difficulty with the situation but doing math at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for the division, we can be pretty sure that it's an aspect of yeah. Uh, the operation itself, but multiplication probably needs uh, deeper analysis of yeah, the problem. Yeah, I, well, actually better problems, <laughs> better. better contexts. So we, we looked into a uh, thesis of, uh, in, in the research of Geke to see if she had other contexts for multiplying two fractions, but mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. not really. Yeah. Okay, let's see what, uh, thanks. Uh, let's see yeah. what are the other questions. Marjolaine and then Erika. Yes, I, I, I want to go to the first part of your talk, to the word problems. I really appreciate that part and I was very surprised by the results. So thank you for that work. And my question is about the word non-standard problem. Because I have other images with a non-standard problem because I think that's a puzzle. In this, in this study, uh, when the child has understand the problem and skipped the irrelevant number, it is a standard problem. It changed into, uh, if, if they have yeah. given the right meaning yeah. to the problem, they can solve it in a standard way. And I believe that a non-standard problem needs to, to construct a new problem-solving approach. Yeah, uh, I would call that a non-routine problem. <laughs> yeah, okay. it, it's, it's, of course it's semantics. <laughs> but uh, uh, then you tap it to a whole different area of, of, yes. of math because problem solving uh, and the non-standard only refers refers to the, the story. Yes, so yeah. you check if they can understand, if they can recognize the standard problem in a little bit complicated story. I was hoping that they would think more <laughs> okay. because there, there are so many numbers and you don't need them all so that they would have, that they would read more carefully and devote more attention to understanding the story instead of finding the numbers and doing the computation. Okay, and, and it's a very important step to, to analyze the, the story. But I'm very curious about problem solving, but that's a complete different It's, it's something else, yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for clarifying more on the specificity of the problems. And Erika? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, about uh, the the last bit 
uh, which is of course also what I'm going to work on. So maybe it's a bit <laughs> selfish, but I wonder what would happen if you would ask children, uh, if you wouldn't give them a piece of paper and ask them to think out loud, because for me, uh, I'm quite sure if I'm given a problem and a piece of paper and I'm asked to do it on a piece of paper, I would probably do some, uh, I don't know, um, column-based or uh, digit-based type of strategy, whereas if I have to solve it in my mind, I would probably do some sort of compensation yeah. strategy. Yeah. But maybe yeah, the end of definitely. primary is too early for that. Yeah, they haven't been taught the digit-based, the vertical formats yeah. yet. Yeah. Um, and of course, it, it probably um, uh, affects what you do if you would have to write yeah. it down. But in, in classrooms, they hopefully are encouraged to write down their work as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. And if you would ask them to think aloud, that would mean a lot of for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm quite so sure. Again. <laughs> so I there will. are more factors and flexibility. Also, the form of answer might really influence. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, then uh, let's maybe, uh, Erika, if you don't mind, uh, uh, move to Kuna's questions. And I also invite now some broader comments and remarks. Uh, thank you. Um, with the second study, I was thinking of the research Shambhri Kramer did on addition and subtraction up to 100. And he found that at that time, there's an emphasis on the uh, jumping strategies. And that was uh, what uh, students could do rather well. Yeah. And uh, what was focused on their teachers, I don't know how it is now. But he found that on the other hand, they did, didn't develop a, a good sense of uh, tens and ones and how this whole number structure is and how you can manipulate that because they were not used in splitting, splitting tens and ones and they invented then their own strategies which they made all kinds of mistakes. So I think that there is also, apart from the strategy, there is a deeper understanding of the numbers that are involved. Yeah, definitely. And I think that is the reason why the, 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 the for instance, compensation strategy, if you had to subtract 19 yeah. and then you subtract 20, and what do you do with the one? Was it too many or too Yeah. yeah. But that's not easy. You have to have good number sense uh, to know what you have to do with that. And have you made a comparison with the work of Shamri? Uh, well, of course, he uses the same strategy. It's, so it's one of the, the, the parts of the literature where we know that, that the jump strategy is focal and the students use it. Now, I, 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 I can imagine that, that what's, what's going on in textbooks and uh, teaching has changed over time. Oh, comparison and that you like could that. see a difference in what students are doing. No, I did not do it like that, but maybe Mark has an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry, I have not. I'm not familiar with the uh, work uh, that Kuno refers to. Okay, yeah. But okay. I could look into that. Yeah, I have his thesis somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, comments also interestingly um, breaches as with your questions. Do we want students to use various strategies and what for? Right. So maybe we'd want them to use different strategies, not for the fake of strategies itself, but because that would be a manifestation of a deeper understanding of a 10 place, uh, yeah. 10 base uh, uh, system. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think that, that, of course, it's not a goal to have those different strategies, but to it it, um, it reflects that you can manipulate uh, numbers and relations between operations. Uh, so it's a kind of higher order thing that you would like students to develop. And if, for instance, this compensation strategy again, of course, it's it also shows you the inverse relation between addition and subtraction. So it's it's. Uh, much more than just a procedure, it hopefully stimulates uh, um, conceptual knowledge as well. 
Mm-hmm. So you you also see the connection with the this um, uh, potential adaptivity and uh, conceptual knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you could of course make a next step and and see where this flexibility really uh, works in terms of uh, understanding. So that you, your test goal is where they have a good understanding of this type of numbers and relations. Yeah. We did have a, a, a task called adaptive number knowledge developed by uh, Jake McMullen from Finland. The kind of taps that uh, whether they know or not really. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so I have some information on that, but we did not give them a test. So that's a, that's a good suggestion for further research to see if they really understand. Uh, yeah, might be a nice follow up. Yeah. Uh, are there more questions? I have uh, maybe one. Uh, I was wondering with this flexibility, your examples on the slides were mostly like 72 minus 67 or something. This is not what provokes specific strategies, right? Because even when you started to talk about teacher, um, uh, teacher, uh, um, interventions, there was examples like 56 minus 39, and this provokes particular strategies. So do you think that the students might avoid using different strategies as far as there is no need? I'm not really sure if I understand, because we had those kind of problems uh, which ended on uh, the, the, the number that had to be subtracted ended on a 9 or an 8, so that can easily be round. And the other one, the, the 72 minus 66 was a, a, a small difference problem, so that should provoke uh, the adding on strategy, the indirect addition strategy. Mm, so you, maybe then I just uh, misunderstood. So you say all examples, you were expecting them to provoke uh, some strategies. Yeah. But students were not following them. No, I did not expect them. They, they were as stimulating as possible to use that particular strategy, but apparently students mm-hmm. were not that stimulated, which was not really surprising. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, maybe we have uh, time for one more comment or remark. Yeah, maybe one comment about first study. Uh, what I found interesting is that it focuses on assessment, and I think the found finding that there's a little difference whether that's uh, with verbal or non-verbal is a very important uh, finding politically. But, uh, so, it's, uh, thank you for that research. Yeah, it's actually been out there since 2013, but I have a hard time trying to get it. <laughs> Under the, under attention, so just, yeah, just like I believe that 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 math results are pretty okay in primary school, and it's still everywhere that math <laughs> results are deteriorating, but they're not. Yeah. So uh, if you have any suggestions on how to make more impact, that would be very helpful. <laughs> I, I don't know, but but when I know, I will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> But I hope I have, have convinced at least you, and maybe you will tell others, and that, that might spread the word. <laughs> I think Mario Lange still wants to know if there's a publication on the first study. Uh, the first study. The first part or the first study? I, I mean the first part of your uh, talk, just about the word problems. This, yeah, uh, three, of the, three of the four studies are published. Um, and uh, of course, I, uh, I, uh, can I put them in the chat? No, that's difficult. I can't find them right now. I, I will search on your name. Yeah. I hope, I hope they will find My it. university's uh, webpage, they are listed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
And uh, there is also a question in the chat, uh, if you have any insights on the teachers provoking flexibility, some teachers provoking more flexibility than others. Oh yeah, uh, probably, but that's what we're going to find out. That's what we hope to find out in the, uh, uh, the final study to that where we relate what teachers do with what students do and to see if there's if first there are teachers that provoke flexibility more than others and second if that um, translates into what students do. I expect it's to some extent, but probably not that strong. Uh, thank you, because well, uh, I thought when you uh, add up all the students and see what they are doing individually, then you 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 are missing maybe uh, some good teachers who uh, yeah. in, in which students can be very adaptive and flexible. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm also collaborating with uh, researchers from uh, Germany, uh, Iso Heinze and Henrik Sievert, and they have a large data set where they also have information about teachers and we, we found some teacher effects, di differences between classrooms or teachers. Thank yeah. you. It's okay, five o'clock. Time is up, yeah. It's, it's, it's normally, it's, this is our ending time, but uh, we also have an after party for those people okay. who can't get enough of this and they just stay here and, and, and they continue talking and no one's going to stop them. Uh, but I am going to take the opportunity but, uh, well, uh, first of all, maybe to thank Marianne once more, right? That's what Anna wanted to do. I hope she doesn't mind I do it, but I thank you, Marianne. Uh, thanks yeah. again. It was uh, wonderful. Thanks again for talk. inviting me. And I think thanks for all the discussion. the impression everyone enjoyed. Thank and, you very much. And then I also I also take a little time to, to advertise something, which is uh, the next meeting, the next seminar, which will be in uh, more or less a month. And uh, what nice thing about your talk, Marion, was that you also moved a little bit into secondary education, which shows we don't let our uh, interests be limited to certain school types. And I hope you're all also interested into higher education because our next uh, speaker Speakers will be uh, Birgit Pepin and uh, Seger Jan Kok from uh, TU Eindhoven. And they'll talk about innovative practices in higher education mathematics, uh, taking, the, taking the student perspective. So I hope to welcome you again in a month. But uh, again, I also hope to welcome you here for the after party, which is uh, starting right now. So just stay and talk. And Anna wants to say something as well, I believe. Uh, uh, not particularly, but if you are not yet subscribed to our list, uh, you can find uh, the link a little uh, earlier during in this meeting. Please uh, get connected. This is a, good, a way to get information about forthcoming seminars. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, then I stop the video for now. And goodbye for those who are not staying. Happy to chat with others. Well, it was nice, uh, Marianne, to see that you attracted some new people again into the seminar. I did. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Yeah, Pro yeah probably. Um, like Marjolein Kohl? Yeah. Yeah, it's... I know her from... No, no, Marjolein yeah. has been here oh. before, but... Oh, okay. uh, yeah, like your own student, Erika, here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Erika's still there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have to go, but I was still copying okay. the links. <laughs> so, why? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, not really a, <laughs> not really party people uh, here. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you see if uh, recording stopped because my teams function all awful? Uh, I can stop it. Okay, let me try once again. I was. Always